Okay, well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Environment Halpern's um, March Enviro Cafe about how the housing crisis, energy poverty, and the climate emergency are all linked together. My name is Susan Hay, and I am the president of, of Environment Halberton. In a moment, we will introduce our speaker, but first our land acknowledgement. Halberton County is situated on the traditional territory of the Mishi Sege and Chippewa nations, collectively known as the William Treaties First Nations and within the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation. We acknowledge that we all live on lands that were dispossessed by colonialism. I like to quote Stan Rushworth, an Indigenous elder of Cherokee descent, who reminds us of the difference between a Western settler mindset of I have rights and an Indigenous mindset of I have obligations. Instead of thinking that I am born with rights, I choose to think that I am born with obligations to serve past, present, and future generations and the planet herself. I would now like to ask Terry Moore, our Vice President, to make a few remarks about how our evening will unfold and to introduce our speaker. Terry, over to you. Thanks, Susan. Um, before I introduce tonight's speaker, Abilash Kantamani, um, or Abby as he prefers to be called, I want to say a couple of things about the Q&A period that will follow Abby's presentation. Um, first on the process, we'd like you to put any comments or questions as they arise um, about any aspects of Abby's presentation into the chat box function that you can access at the bottom of your page. Um, while Abby is speaking, I'll be monitoring those comments and questions. And once he's finished, I'll start working my way through them um, and, You know, as you put them in chat. I may put questions and comments together um, if, they have, if they share a common theme or similar topics. Now about tonight's topic of energy poverty and the climate emergency. Tonight's Enviro Cafe is one of the many Enviro Cafe discussions Environment Halliburton has sponsored over the past 10 years or so focused on the climate emergency. Many of those events have centered on the fossil-based fuel causes of global heating, the urgent need to rein in emissions and transition to a low uh, carbon uh, energy system as if our lives depended on it because they do. EH has also tried to shine a spotlight on the growing immediate threats to human and non-human life from climate change driven risks such as biodiversity loss, habitat loss, extreme precipitation and flooding, dangerous levels of heat and drought, as well as wildfire. It used to be that climate change mitigation action or efforts to, to start filling in the emissions hole, so to speak, that we're in, was seen as being more urgent than adaptation action needed to have each other's backs as we grapple with the consequence of warming from past emissions. Now there's an increasing awareness that mitigation and adaptation actions are two sides of the same climate change action coin requiring equally urgent attention. Tonight's presentation on energy poverty is meant to shine a light on an issue that bridges both sides of the mitigation adaptation boundary, energy poverty. We hope to have more conversations like this in the future. For a, I'm, I'm pleased to, to welcome Abilash Kantamani or Abby, the Energy Poverty and Low Income Energy Research Manager for Efficiency Canada uh, to our grouping tonight as our speaker. Abby will help us better understand what energy poverty means and why efforts to address it bridge both sides of the climate action, uh, action coin. Abby's community-based approach to energy efficiency, civic engagement, and capacity building has earned him widespread recognition, including being named a 40 under 40 energy leader by the Midwest Energy News and a Canada Storyteller Award by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Abby has a Master's of Science in Physics and Community Science from, University, from Michigan Tech and a Bachelor of Engineering in Electrical Engineering from Anna University. Please join me in welcoming our presenter for tonight, Abilash Kanamani. Over to you, Abby. Thanks, Terry. That was, that was a great introduction. <laughs> I loved it. I wish I could take you around with me in my pocket so you can introduce me to places. Uh, let me see if I can start sharing my screen and if that works well, and then we can uh, 
Get going. Uh, can folks see my screen? All clear? Awesome. Okay. So uh, like Terry mentioned, my name is Abhi. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about energy poverty. First of all, thanks a lot for including me and inviting me over. I have never been to Halliburton before, although I have lived in Ontario. I've been in Canada now for about seven years now, I think, and but I grew up in India. Um, we lived in Guelph, Ontario for a little while. It turns out Terry was is from Guelph, which I didn't know before we started this call. It's pretty exciting. Uh, and I now have an open invitation to visit Halliburton County anytime. And Susan, as my witness, Terry has invited me over to stop by in person. And one day I'd love to meet you all in person. But for now, this will have to do because I live in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Um, so let me ask you guys this. Why <laughs> Why are you here? It's, uh, it's 7 p.m. on a weekday evening. Uh, why bother? understanding energy poverty, right? Why is it important to know what energy poverty is? <clears throat> what will you do if I gave you some information? Uh, how do you plan on using it in your daily life? I want you to think about that a little bit as I go through uh, the rest of this presentation. So if you're like me uh, and you have a bit of an analytical mind or maybe you are community-minded, community-focused, uh, what you measure and how you define it really determines how you solve problems. So the the what I'm hoping to do today is to help uh, everyone here get a little bit of a better understanding of what the scale and nature of the problem of energy poverty is, who is affected and how, what can we do to develop like solutions that are effective and meet people's needs where they're at, how can we track progress towards goals of like ending energy poverty and or uh, taking action on climate and or uh, taking action on um, housing affordability and the housing crisis that we face in Canada right now? And how do we ensure that we hold our systems accountable to delivering on those goals that I'm fairly confident all of us on this call share? And that will roughly be the sort of format of my presentation. So I'll talk about what energy poverty is, who's affected, what solutions are effective and how to track progress towards it and how can we together help our systems maintain accountability. Now then, what is, what is energy poverty? I got some bad news for you to start. Uh, in Canada, we do not have an official definition <clears throat> of energy poverty. It's uh, Canada is one of the few G7, G8, probably even G10 countries that does not have an official definition of energy poverty. So we must soldier on to try to imagine uh, or try to articulate a definition of what energy poverty could be like. So if you wanted to put things on a scale and if energy poverty was on one end, what would you put on the other end? Like what would be the opposite? So I mean, not not that these are binary options. There, it's a spectrum, and for, if one end represents more energy poverty, what would the other end be? Do you think, Terry? Can people type in chat? Is that allowed, or am I breaking too many rules already? Oh, Terry, you might be on mute. I'm sorry. Oh. Okay. Uh, yeah, I will soldier on. Um, the other end would be energy well-being. A way to understand energy well-being is that households have adequate access to affordable, sustainable, clean, reliable energy to meet their household needs and for them to continue to thrive and um, uh, and and uh, and meet their uh, you know basic housing needs. This is what uh, when we say and I say the words energy poverty, it's very likely that uh, that your brain conjures up an image like this. It's where a situation where a household does not have access to adequate energy to maintain well-being in their home. And I want you to pay close attention to each word in that sentence. So what, and I want you to think about what unable to access means, what adequate energy means, and what well-being means for different households, and how it may or may not change depending on a household circumstances, their socioeconomic profile, uh, their cultural practices, the kind of housing they live in, uh, the resources and tools they have access to and things like that, and how each of these, um, how this might manifest differently in 
um, the households and, and homes of different people, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. And we also do not have a measure or indicator for energy poverty. Actually, Canada didn't have an official indicator of poverty to begin with, just straight up poverty, until I think in 2019 or 2020, uh, the current federal government introduced Canada's official poverty line. We used to have three different measures. Uh, we now have an official measure of poverty in general, but we don't have a measure or indicator uh, of what energy poverty means. So if we were to try to define what energy poverty is and, and how we might measure it and how it might look like, it makes sense to start by trying to understand what energy poverty is caused by. Uh, so there's three factors, primary determinants of energy poverty. Does anyone want to take a guess in the chat before I soldier on? Spoiler alert, uh, it's low incomes, high energy costs or high energy use, and inefficient or, or poor, drafty, leaky homes. Now, the interesting thing about this <clears throat> is that each of these is not just an independent factor, but they actually reinforce each other and they're held together by some structural conditions. And think about this, right? So if you have uh, low incomes, low disposable incomes, and you already live in a house that has high energy costs, chances are a significant portion of your income is going towards paying for your energy bills. And you have very less money, uh, if even if you own the home, to invest in energy efficiency upgrades. And so, and similarly, if you had, you know, if you lived in a poor quality um, home and you had low income, chances are a significant portion of your income goes towards high cost because your house is just a sieve that's leaking energy and money is flowing out of uh, your windows and doors and things like that. So these factors, while they are separate, they're also kind of linked together and they kind of reinforce each other to create the set of circumstances that we often <clears throat> commonly associate with energy poverty. I don't know if people know this and if you remember this, there was a brief period of time, I think it was in 2016, 2017, when uh, fidget spinners were a gadget that you could use, you know, to just play around and stuff. And so that's, of using fidget spinner to illustrate the concept that energy poverty is something that, it, it's these three factors kind of interacting together in, in, in complex ways to produce uh, what energy poverty is. And what this leads us to then is an attempt, an attempt at uh, defining a measure, like how do you measure energy poverty? Given that these are the set of circumstances, how do you measure energy poverty? And here's the latest numbers. And I know Terry referenced this in the chat with uh, uh, with me earlier. You can go on a website called energypoverty.ca uh, put together by an organization called CUSP, Canada Urban Sustainability Practices Network. And um, it uses 2016 data uh, to define what energy poverty is, but what they're actually looking at is energy cost burdens. So the idea is if a household spends more than 6% of their after-tax income on home energy bills, then that household is said to be experiencing energy cost burdens. And energy uh, disproportionate income spent on energy uh, is called, technical term is energy cost burden, and if your household has a high energy cost burdens, then chances are you're at a higher risk of experiencing all the consequences that come with energy poverty. It doesn't mean uh, your household is in energy poverty directly. It simply means that, you know, it, and I, I should say the best way that you think about it is that you have a greater risk of experiencing energy poverty because you're spending a disproportionate portion of your income on energy costs. Now, why 6%? Why not 2%? Why not 25%? There's a bit of history to this, 6%, because um, used to be a median household in Canada spent 3% of their income on energy costs. Uh, so we can say twice the average median, uh, so that with 6% is spent uh, on home energy bills. And there's also two to three different ways of arriving at the 6% number, but it is not an official definition, but it is a definition that's used by a lot of organizations. We at Efficiency Canada are now putting together a data set uh, with using the more latest uh, census data, using the 2021 census data, it'll be available soon. I'll let Terry know, and maybe Terry can put that in the newsletter so you can then access and look at what the latest energy poverty situation in your hometowns in Halberton County would look like. So by this number, 
around 2 million households are at the risk in Canada are at the risk of energy experience energy poverty. And as you can see, uh, the, the risk of experiencing energy poverty is higher in, in the Atlantic provinces for a combination of reasons. We can get into that later. Um, yeah, but it is prevalent in nearly every single province across the entire country. Now, um, we talked about, so this is this the, this is the relationship between energy costs and incomes, right? So we've come up with a metric based on relationship between costs and incomes. Now let's try another metric based on the relationship between energy cost and maybe a quality of homes. Uh, so this is the chart for, this is another way of looking at energy poverty where we say, Households that spend more than 30% of their housing costs on energy bills. So like almost a third of like everything that you spend for your house goes just towards your energy bills. Then you're at a greater risk of experiencing energy poverty. So by this metric, almost twice as many, four and a half million households, or actually more than twice as many, four and a half million households are at the risk of uh, experiencing energy poverty. And as you can see, similar patterns happen here as well. Uh, in the Atlantic provinces, uh, you're at a greater risk of experiencing energy poverty. And I know Terry told me that based on the 2016 cusp numbers, 60% of uh, Halliburton County experiences energy poverty. So that is like this number. So 60, the way to understand it is 63% or two out of three um, homes or households or families in Halliburton County uh, spend a disproportionate portion of their income on energy costs. It could be because incomes are low. It could be because energy costs are high. It could be because the homes are old and leaky. It could be a combination of these things. Uh, but they are at a greater risk of experiencing energy poverty and everything that comes associated with it because of high energy cost burdens. Now, a question I get asked often is, Abhi, why, how is energy poverty different from just poverty in general? It seems like to me, that if you are a low income, then maybe yeah. So sure, you know, if you're if you're low income, obviously you pay a higher portion of your energy costs, a higher portion of your income on energy costs. Likely that you live in a in a home that's not built to modern energy standards. So isn't low isn't um, energy poverty merely a function of just incomes? Um, I think the answer to that is a little bit more complicated than just a yes. A little bit more complicated than just a no. So here is, I took some data from 2021 census all across Canada. Uh, I looked at the, you remember we talked about the high energy cost burden metric. So, and I, then I broke that out by income. So yes, the lower income you are. So if you're in the lowest 10% of incomes in Canada, household income, then you have a one out of three chance roughly to also experience energy poverty. If you're in the second lowest 10%, one in four chances and so on. So if you are in the top 10% earners, then chances are 1% of, uh, you know, very small chance that you're spending a disproportionate portion of your income on home energy. So yes, there is a, a linear or, or, or a maybe not, there is a relationship between poverty and energy poverty, but the difference is that poverty is a set of circumstances that uh, is, is caused while by incomes, uh, energy poverty, is is caused not just by incomes, but in the way that uh, it interacts with housing and in the way that it interacts with climate. Uh, and the way to think about this is that, you know, um, there are multiple ways in which we tackle poverty, right? So one way poverty shows up in people's households is food insecurity. And we have food banks and people like access food banks to help them deal with poverty in their homes. Uh, and so thinking about poverty as food security as an entry point into poverty gives us a new set of tools, brings in new actors, brings in new resources to bear upon a problem. Energy poverty is similar like that. Uh, the way to look at energy poverty would be a set of um, socioeconomic inequalities that can be addressed by improving the energy efficiency of people's homes. By improving people's homes, energy efficiency uh, you know, they spend less of their money on incomes and they are less at risk of experiencing energy poverty and, and less at risk of experiencing just material uh, deprivation in general. Uh, and so that's the relationship in power and energy poverty. They're related, uh, but it's also meaningful and useful to think about energy poverty as a, as a distinct problem that needs its own set of resources, own approaches, and that can actually solve uh, a, multiple problems and multiple national priorities beyond just uh, as an anti-poverty effort. So what does energy poverty look like and how does it show up uh, in people's lives? 
as I mentioned before, and maybe Terry mentioned before, or Susan mentioned this, but I grew up in India, and we have a story in Indian mythology, and it's uh, six blindfolded people and an elephant. And, you know, and if they don't know what they're interacting with, uh, one person touches the trunk and says, oh, I think I'm holding a spear. And one person holds the tail and says, oh, my God, I think I'm holding onto a rope. And one person holds, you know, the, 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 a leg of an elephant and thinks they're holding a tree trunk. I mean, you get the idea, right? Uh, so the, the moral of the story, as I understand it, is that, you know, different people, the same uh, material, material reality shows up in different people's lives differently based on the circumstances of their living situation uh, and the complexity of their life and their own lived experiences. Energy poverty is quite similar that way. Uh, for some households, it means the choice, making the choice between heating and eating. Some households, it means you're at an increased risk of physical illness. For some households, it manifests as stress, loss of concentration. Uh, for some people, it just means deferred maintenance on uh, essential upgrades to your home. Uh, for some people, it means increased risk of uh, health-related uh, issues due to extreme weather events like we saw in Alberta and BC a couple of years ago. And so based on your um, individual circumstances and, set, and, and socio-demographic economic profile, uh, energy poverty would show up in different ways in different people's homes. And so that's where uh, the, um, the slide we showed earlier matters because uh, you know what unable to access energy means, what adequate energy means, and what well-being means in people's homes is quite subjective. It is very unique, uh, and it's a personal experience for a lot of people. So there is a, it, it is it, it, in some ways it's empirical because we can tell, say, you know, it's a combination of incomes, and and, and so it's a combination of very material and empirical things that you can measure, but the experience of what it feels like to be in energy poverty, how it affects you mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, that can be quite a personal experience. And a lot of it happens behind closed doors and it's not often visible and it's not often uh, very easy to intervene and provide solutions, leave alone, like not, not easy to measure and understand the extent of it, leave alone, intervene and provide uh, solutions to do so. And because energy poverty happens behind closed doors, here's an example. How many of these consequences of energy poverty do you think you can name if I gave you 25 seconds? You just write it down on a piece of paper. You're not competing against anyone but yourself. In fact, you're not even competing with yourself. You're just trying to guess, right? So there's about eight, nine, 10 different uh, ways in which it manifests, probably likely a lot more that I have. I myself haven't highlighted. So what, how energy poverty shows up behind closed doors is in terms of material reality, uh, drafty windows, people have trouble sleeping, uh, heating or cooling indoor temperatures are not adequate to meet uh, comfort standards and are not adequate to meet health standards. You end up using, a lot of people end up, you know, uh, in an effort to save energy bills, they use uh, localized, you know, small portable heating, which is known to have risks of fire um, and uh, rural communities in particularly are at a higher risk of, uh, of uh, fire-related fatalities in Canada, in part due to use of uh, portable heating systems and so on. People make tough choices between heating and eating. They have mounting debt, floors that are too cold, which means it's increased risk of like slipping and falling and, and injuries. Uh, condensation happens behind uh, windows uh, if there isn't a, if there's a big enough temperature differential between rooms. The one room is heated more and the other room is not. And then you get mold and mildew, which itself leads to a, a whole host of complicated set of problems. Uh, so when you go back to lived experience, like in terms of like emotional and, and in terms of how it affects your life beyond just those material things, it's, it means your chronic illness, your poor indoor air quality, uh, kids have trouble focusing and, and, and perform poorly in schools. And this is research that's been done in the United Kingdom that shows uh, that, that tries to draw a relationship between like, uh, you know, uh, lower than expected temperatures indoors and, and dropping in focus and concentration. Um, in many provinces in the country, missing utility bills and is can be tantamount to missing rent payments. So if you're a renter, it can mean eviction, uh, losing your home, losing your community. And, and forced to have to relocate and, uh, and experiencing home insecurity. And so this is what 
energy poverty means. It's not just high energy cost burdens, although that is uh, one way to, to measure it. It's not just people missing utility bill payments, although that is one of the effects. It's not just people struggling to heat or eat, although that is a significant component. We need to be very careful to think about the entire chain of where, what the underlying conditions are, what are households vulnerable to existing vulnerabilities, and how does energy poverty accelerate it uh, and, and or make it worse? And how does it, uh, how is it mediated or how is it, how does it, a change depending on a household's ability to cope uh, or, or a household's ability to respond adequately uh, to challenges. So ultimately, energy poverty, uh, it, where it shows up is that it shows up as negative outcomes for both housing and then physical and mental health and also for climate, but primarily for housing and uh, households' physical and mental health. The icon on the top says that we are working on a research project right now to kind of map lived experiences of each household is kind of like a, like a different kinds of demographic profiles, like newcomers, seniors, rural communities, uh, single parents, and so on, and trying to map them to, uh, you know, individual, <clears throat> trying to map them to uh, negative outcomes uh, or to housing and health. So let's look at what these solutions look like from the perspective of those that uh, that need them the most. So we talked about what the energy poverty is, how it shows up as negative outcomes. Uh, and here is what here is like here's the framework that uh, researchers and 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 practitioners in the UK uh, and and European Union are using to conceptualize and think about energy poverty. Like we said before, there are you know what energy poverty does is it amplifies like existing uh, vulnerability to negative health and housing outcomes. So a household has a certain number of underlying conditions. So let's take seniors for example. Seniors in Canada are known to experience what is called core housing need, which is a technical term. What it really means is that your house, you are in core housing need if uh, you live in a house that's either unaffordable or um, uh, or in or um, doesn't quite meet the standards. If there's overcrowding, uh, or if your rent is or your rent or mortgage is greater than thirty percent of income, so there's a set of factors that determine if you're in core housing need and seniors in Canada are more likely than other age groups to experience core housing needs, particularly uh, seniors above the age of 80 and 85 who rent uh, are nearly three times as more likely to experience core housing need compared to any other demographic group in Canada. <clears throat> uh, seniors are more, as we know this, you know, more likely to experience cardiovascular conditions and seniors are more likely to uh, injure themselves uh, slipping and falling in their own homes, and 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 even when and 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 the, the pernicious thing is that not only are they more vulnerable to this happening, they're also more likely to experience the negative consequences of this happening in, in the form of like um, you know injuries that take a long time healing and um, and things like that. Now, these are underlying conditions. Maybe don't have really much to do with climate, although we can make an argument. Uh, maybe don't have really much to do with uh, with uh, energy poverty, although although we are going to make that argument. So let's look at one energy related risk factor. So suppose you live in a cold and drafty home. What happens is that if you live in a cold and drafty home, it means that your home is leaking heat. It cannot retain heat, which means your money and is just flowing out of the window, which increases your likelihood of experiencing core housing need. Uh, cold homes, especially for seniors, are shown uh, shown to increase the risk of experiencing cardiovascular conditions. And cold and drafty homes, especially cold homes where the floor uh, is cold, uh, is is, uh, is is there's evidence to show that there's an increased risk of fall, uh, and also it decreases mobility for seniors, which also increases the risk of falling uh, falling off of like footstools and and things like that, and it restricts their mobility and and. Uh, uh, and creates more long-term health issues. So, so have, living in a cold and drafty home, which is kind of an energy-related risk factor, increases your risk to, an, to vulnerabilities that seniors are already experiencing. Now, inability to respond would be, you know, when you go back to the three factors that we talked about in terms of uh, energy poverty, if you had low savings, if you didn't, if you low incomes, low retirement savings and stuff like that, uh, chances are that you won't be able to respond adequately to the risk of cold and drafty homes. You may not be able to afford to uh, pay upfront for the cost of energy efficiency upgrades. You may not be able to pay to afford to heat your home to an adequate standard. And so you have a re reduced resilience to 
uh, the risks posed by by the risk of energy related thing or the risk of energy poverty. So this journey between underlying conditions, bad outcomes through uh, energy related risk factors and the inability to respond adequately is the universe of energy poverty. Uh, I'll give you another example uh, as well. So, you know, another example, inability to respond could be renter. So you, regardless of your income, if you're a renter, you do not have the permission uh, to make upgrades to your home. You do not have the permission or, or the means or even the ability or the guarantee that you will continue to live in that house if you invested in upgrading insulation or air ceiling. And so that also increases your risk of experiencing bad outcomes, regardless of your income. And then again, seniors are what are the so one of the so-called hard to reach communities because of uh, what they call a digital literacy gap. Uh, so uh, you know, if you if you have an energy efficiency program and it's on a website like the Federal Greener Homes Program, chances are you serve some demographics, including seniors, are not really able to access that information because. Um, you know, because it's not just this literacy, but also seniors are more prone uh, to uh, getting scammed by false advertising and stuff online research shows. So um, they are unlikely to avail of even existing uh, free or energy efficiency resources, uh, which as, which means that, you know, the, uh, the, the condition, the journey of what energy poverty does, it accelerates their existing risk to all of these different negative outcomes. Now, Another example, I won't run it through it uh, line by line, but basically single parent households, about four out of five single parent households in Canada are single mom households. And so they are um, more likely to have significant caregiving responsibility uh, and, and they experience what we call depleted resilience. Basically their bandwidth is low to deal with um, anything beyond uh, their immediate needs and caregiving responsibility. So if, they, if, if a lone parent lived uh, or a single parent household, you know, was had damp and moldy walls for whatever reason, including uh, due to energy poverty. Um, chances are, if, you, if you're in Ontario and you, even if you qualify for a low income energy assistance program, uh, the program requires like three touch points with you. Someone has to come to your home one day, do a walkthrough, give you some advice, uh, and then come back another day to install measures that is needed and come back another day to uh, to verify and check that the installation was done correctly. So three different touch points. Do single parent households have the ability to stay at home for a day? I mean, we've all dealt with contractors, right? I mean, again, I'm not, uh, low income programs in Ontario are, are run by professionals who do a fantastic job. I'm not knocking on them specifically, but I'm just telling you that, you know, for single parent households, they, with depleted resilience, it is unlikely the friction that these three touch points adds to their daily life might seem like uh, a, enough of a hump for them to not avail of existing opportunities to improve housing conditions, even if they are no cost turnkey upgrades. So what this has shown is damp and moldy walls increases the risk of respiratory illness and flu-like symptoms for kids and kids in um, homes with, uh, with mold and stuff like that struggle to focus, struggle to fall asleep. Uh, and underperformance schools. And so energy poverty casts a long shadow through the lives of people. And it's not just uh, about not you know being able to pay your bills. And so um, obviously I won't go through this entire thing, but I'm just showing you that for each of, uh, in the as you see in the icon there, one of the resources that we are building, which will be available soon, is trying to map out this journey for different demographic groups like this or, or select demographic groups like this. Uh, collecting evidence. Each of the claims in that uh, in the document will be evidence based based on studies in Canada, uh, and then with less of a priority studies in UK, US, and European Union. Uh, looking at experiences of seniors, looking at what their existing vulnerabilities are to things, looking at whether they are at a higher risk of certain energy related risk factors, and their inability to respond, and journey mapping. Uh, what that journey and the lived experience of energy poverty looks like. And so these are all archetypes, right? These are archetypes. By archetypes, I mean it's a user profile. It's an approximation. In physics, when I went to school in physics, um, some problems, most problems in, let's say, you know, orbital mechanics uh, ask you to assume that the object that you're dealing with is a spherical cow <laughs> in a vacuum uh, a spherical cow of uniform density 
uh, in a vacuum or on a frictionless surface. The reason they do that is because, you know, what you want is a, is a general archetype so that you can understand some first principles, you can understand what things might look like, get a general, get at least be directionally correct in your understanding of an issue. Uh, these are not meant to be like real life examples. We're not doing real life case studies. Uh, I would like to, but I don't have the resources to do that. What we're doing is like developing archetypes so you have a sense of how energy poverty might look like in different households, which might point to uh, what can be done about it and how can we solve these problems and who needs to do what. Um, Terry, I want to check with you. Are we still good for time? Yeah, okay. I will soldier on bravely then. And I will trust you to cut me off and cast me to the lions if I overextend my welcome. Um, so remember earlier we talked about common determinants of energy poverty, low incomes, high energy costs, inefficient homes. Uh, my argument is that there are several different ways of dealing with energy poverty. I know that, uh, for example, there is the heat bank, uh, Halliburton Heat Bank. Uh, I had a very brief conversation over email with uh, Tina Jackson. Uh, and the heat bank does some really amazing work uh, and uh, they deserve the support of the community. And, and, uh, and the work that they do is, is um, crucial because as we are developing more systemic long-term solutions, people need immediate help and relief. And so anything that can help them meet their emergency energy needs or high energy costs, anything that helps them supplement their low incomes to meet their energy bills is something that I will... Uh, uh, unabashedly and in how do you pronounce that word? Sorry, English is not my first language. Uh, I will shout at it from the rooftops that you should we should all consider supporting efforts like that. Uh, the focus of our work at Efficiency Canada is on uh, policy change, uh, orienting our system towards long term solutions, and the and the, one of the more long term solutions that uh, that we are focused on is improving housing quality. And the reason for that is um, if magically somehow tomorrow every single energy system, I wave, I wave my you know, trusted magic wand and every single energy system across this country was suddenly hum somehow magically uh, free to use, people would still in, in many uh, parts of the country have drafty windows. They would still have trouble sleeping. They'd still have all of these problems in part because in Canada, we haven't really prioritized upgrading houses to modern housing standards. And so the focus of our efforts at Efficiency in Canada has been to direct policy attention towards uh, improving quality of homes through targeted energy efficiency retrofits towards households that need it the most. So I started Efficiency in Canada in 2021. Efficiency Canada itself is very new. Uh, we've been around since 2018. Uh, Efficiency Canada is like a think tank housed within Carleton University. And uh, the major focus of our work is research on and recommendations on policies, fed, primarily federal uh, and then uh, municipal and uh, provincial. And so when I started, this is the first word report I worked on almost a year and a half ago, almost two years ago at this point, wow, time flies. Uh, looking at, okay, what are existing programs in the country doing uh, and what more needs to be done? What I found was that existing provincial programs are doing some amazing things. Nearly every province in the country has a low-income energy efficiency program engaging between 50 to 60,000 households. Now, that's not a lot of households in, given the scale of the problem, but reaching 50 to 60,000 households, building relationship with local uh, uh, you know, institutions, uh, earning the trust of hard to reach households. Those are monumental achievements. Uh, getting brand recognition, uh, being a trusted uh, uh, you know, installer, being let into people's homes to make upgrades to their homes. It's a, it's a big um, lift. And existing programs are doing fantastic things along those lines, um, but they, they do face some challenges. And I'll get to that later uh, in, in just one more slide. Another report we wrote, we followed that report by zooming really into rental energy efficiency, trying to understand how do we improve energy efficiency for rental housing without those costs and the consequences being passed down to tenants. Uh, and we developed a, a policy mix approach, taking a mix of policies from 
tenant protections, mix of policies from building uh, energy efficiency standards, putting them together to create a policy mix through which we can use uh, improving energy efficiency of rental housing as a lever to secure better quality housing, secure a better relationship between uh, uh, with tenants and with their landlords and secure more rights uh, for tenants. As an example, in the United States, uh, you know, there's a federal low income energy efficiency program has been around for 50 years. Uh, and it is their renters are eligible. And if your landlord agrees to participate in it, uh, your rental house gets free energy efficiency upgrades. But in return, your landlord signs uh, an affordability covenant saying that they will not increase rents for a certain period of time until the lifetime of measures. It's di it differs from province to province, or I should say from state to state. So there are mechanisms that we can use to both improve energy efficiency of rental housing and secure uh, and improve housing affordability and uh, housing security for renters. And renters are an increasing uh, population in Canada. Nearly a third of Canada is renting now. Uh, a significant amount of new housing being built in Canada is a purpose-built rental housing. And so this is a sector that Canada and Canadian policy needs to pay attention to if we are to reach our net zero or our energy retrofit or our housing target goals. So what existing programs are not very good at doing is that you know they a lot of them do very shallow measures uh, and because they're governed by like utility regulatory environments they are incentivized to to just find like the bottom hanging fruit they call it just the cheapest energy savings per dollar invested so they don't invest like really deeper measures because they don't have the mandate to do so because they are governed by uh, you know making sure that um ratepayers money used for energy efficiency programs is like quote unquote used effectively. There's no appeal switching. Uh, by, by that I mean provincial programs don't really switch people off from oil to a heat pump, for example, even if uh, such a even if such a switch would actually end up saving money and and uh, and being better for participants. And it's because these programs are delivered by silos for utility. Uh, electricity programs are delivered by electric utility and uh, gas programs are delivered by gas utilities in every province in the country. There's no health and safety upgrades. Uh, so a lot of households actually that need energy efficiency measures the most often suffer from the worst consequences of not having energy efficient homes. Uh, some of it could be like, you know, mold in the walls and, and mold in the windows. And because these existing programs don't have the mandate to do mold remediation or asbestos removal, those households, like the worst uh, or lowest or poorest quality households are disqualified from participating in programs, uh, even though they might be the ones that um, are likely to uh, benefit and gain the most. And existing programs, they don't really have a mandate to target households that need it the most. It's a lot of it is on a first come first basis. Uh, they don't really do, I mean, they do some kind of market segmentation, but they're not really focused on like trying to understand which demographic group is at a greater risk of health uh, consequences and housing consequences? All of that is behind, the, you know, beyond their mandate. Um, they work with third-party, um, you know, uh, providers to aggregate as many people as possible, or to bring in as many people as possible and process them on a first-come, first serve basis. So think about all the people that are missing out, right? Seniors, uh, newcomers who don't have access to, who don't trust, or or have, have are really familiar with legacy media who may not have found out about these programs are often uh, excluded uh, from participating and receiving the benefits of such a program. So the recommendation we make is that uh, what uh, climate policies really and retrofit policies need to do is to take a multi-pronged approach uh, to energy poverty, uh, addressing underlying vulnerabilities helping reduce the risks of, uh, of something like energy poverty happening, improving people's ability to respond adequately, improving their resilience, uh, giving them the tools and resources to respond to challenges adequately, and to focus on improving lives for people, uh, uh, and with, with an emphasis on improving indoor air quality and indoor uh, air standards and things like that. Uh, this is a framework we're working uh, working on. Um, you know, like energy poverty, the best way to think about it is that it's, um, given what we've learned so far, it's a set of like overlapping social and economic inequalities and national priorities even, like climate, housing, um, uh, energy standards that can be addressed by leading uh, your, your tools and your efforts with targeted energy efficiency. So I think if we started with the approach that everyone should have an access to 
an efficient home and then added health and safety upgrades and then helped uh, as we're making these upgrades while people are in the home. Now these There are programs in the United States where you know when if you're a senior um, and you are getting an energy efficiency upgrade for free while people are already make, in your home making those improvements, you get like anti-slip guardrails. Uh, you get, uh, if you if you're a chronic illness or long-term disability, disability, you get like a, a ramp for mobility access and things like that. Uh, is is to make these homes healthy, uh, holistic, uh, improve the quality of homes, and not just be narrowly focused on like kilowatt hour savings and dollar savings, although that is important. And then make these homes climate ready, like Terry said, you know, um, uh, bridging the gap between uh, mitigation and adaptation. Most homes get a once in a generation opportunity for an energy efficiency upgrade. So while we are upgrading homes. Uh, it makes sense to make them climate ready. By climate ready, I mean that homes that can withstand changing climates uh, can provide a refuge, uh, can can be a, a safe place for you as climates are changing in the future, and also homes that do not contribute significantly uh, to climate change as well. And so that's that's the by leading by with energy efficiency, we can achieve all of these outcomes uh, for particularly with the focus on Canadians that need it the most. Given all that. We're at the home stretch, folks. Um, so I appreciate your patience. Uh, here is my personal definition of what a national energy poverty reduction goal would look like. I'm basing this off of UK's definition that says the you know in the United Kingdom they say I forget the exact year. I think it might be 2030, uh, 2030, 2035 that no low income household in UK will live in a least efficient home. And, and that is their national climate target. Like it's baked into their climate targets that no low income household will live in a least efficient home. So I like that approach because uh, they are prioritizing and centering households that need it the most, low income households, households that need most resources, least efficient homes in climate action. And I think we can take a leaf from their book uh, and my definition would be that no Canadian household that is vulnerable to energy poverty in the way that we discussed vulnerability will live in a home that's rated below modern energy standards. So if you're building a home today in Halberton County, whatever the prevailing building code is, or maybe whatever tier one, tier two code, 2020 um, model building code that you aspire to build to, by 2035, by 2040, uh, or whatever year is, is both pragmatic, but also scales ambition, no Canadian household that is uh, vulnerable to energy poverty will live in a house that is worse performing than a house that would be built today under modern energy standards. And by this definition, I think it makes, uh, it focuses our efforts on things that we can control the most, which is the quality of homes uh, and, and baking this into our national housing targets and national climate targets will ensure uh, that uh, this, uh, effort to reduce energy poverty has salience, uh, and that if it's and that it ensures that as in, in, and and also because that this is a pragmatic approach because no road to 2050 climate goals, no road to you know uh, housing is a is a human right will go. Uh, there's no road that reaches those goals without going through these as an interim milestone because without focusing on improving housing standards for um, lowest quality homes and for uh, vulnerable Canadians that are the most vulnerable, it is unlikely uh, that we will reach our climate housing uh, uh, workforce and um, energy poverty goals. So I think I see a role for the federal government to play is that not to come up with their whole new program like they did a while ago, um, and try to like uh, you know offer loans as a mechanism for funding uh, low income energy efficiency programs because you know low income households don't have uh, the appetite for taking on more additional debt, even if it's the federal government uh, providing the loan, and even if the loan is no cost. So a federal government can do itself and us a, a huge favor by just working with existing programs, defining energy poverty. Uh, you know, um, and providing a high level goal and target, setting a high level goal and target. You work with the existing programs to help them grow deeper, reach more homes, do more fuel switching in situations where it might be appropriate, uh, provide health and safety upgrades that existing programs do not have the mandate to do, 
uh, and then uh, work with provincial programs to identify and target uh, measures for households that need it the most and households that are have conventionally been hard to reach, uh, like seniors or newcomers and things like that. And I really scale up the ambition of existing programs so we can align energy efficiency and retrofits with climate goals, uh, with housing goals, uh, and uh, with uh, and, and improve life for uh, our fellow Canadians. And I can say fellow Canadians because I just, I don't know if you can see my flag in the background, but I just became a full-time Canadian like about a year ago, year and a half ago, I think so. That's me. Thanks for having me, folks. I will now be open for questions. Thank you, Abby, for that. I uh, there's a there's a number of questions that people have already put into the chat box, and more coming in. Uh, as time goes on. So I encourage everybody who, uh, if you haven't uh, already put a comment or a question in chat and you want to put it a, a one of those two to Abby, please do so now and, and I'll begin working it through. So Abby, have you, can you end your, your screen sharing? Sure thing. Okay, thank you. And um, okay, so I'm going to start just working my way through uh, some of the questions in chat right now. So um, there's a question from Pat Erickson about how household energy consumption is measured. Is it, is it, is it a total of heating, light, charging uh, costs? And how is that data collected for purposes of the graphs that you presented us with earlier tonight? Fantastic question, Pat. It's almost like I planted you in the audience because this is a question that I was hoping to put in my slide, but I didn't want to take up too much of my time. So, um, if you've done the long form census, so Canada collects census information every five years. The most recent one was in 2021. Uh, if you've had the privilege or maybe the misfortune of having to do the long form census, there is one question in there. It's uh, E7B. The question asks you, can you tell us how much you spent on utilities in the, over the last year? Now there's what, maybe 45 people on this call. I'm willing to bet 45 bucks that not a single person on this call can guess exactly how much they spent on utilities in the last year. And yet the data for that, the only data we have about household energy consumption at the national level comes from the census data our response to that one particular question. Is it's a self-reported number of how much energy, how much money you're paying in utilities every year. And then what we did was we asked Statistics Canada to take at each household level, that number, divide that number by the household's uh, after-tax income uh, and to see what percentage number it is. And then we calculated how many households fall below a certain threshold, like 6%. It is, the as a measure, it's pretty bad, but like like they say, right? Like with, like with models, um, all of them are bad, but some of them are, are useful. And so like as a measure, it has problems because it is a self-reported number uh, and, and, and because it is, it is you know, prone to um, mis or, or mis um, miscalculation or just bad guessing. Uh, but it is the best uh, number we have to kind of characterize what, what uh, energy poverty or uh, just the energy cost burden should look like. So yes, it would include, it doesn't separate heating, lighting and stuff separately. It just asks how much did you spend for your utilities over the last year? Okay, so do you augment any of those, any of those numbers that come from the self-reporting with any kind of studies that try to drill down into, into this directly uh, and try to, to, to get a more accurate picture? Or is there anybody doing that? Or is it all of this just simply reliant on self-reporting uh, through the census? So far, all of it is on self-reported from the census because um, that's the only data that's available at the national scale. There are some efforts at the municipal level uh, that are trying to do some kind of sampling to understand uh, uh, even more closely. Right? I mean, even this census, like it came out in 2021 and we are in 2024 already. So it's already three years out of date. A lot has happened. My bananas have gone from like being 50 cents to 90 cents in the last three years. So a lot of reality has changed. So to get a better grip on like more like up-to-date information, there are some local efforts underfoot to, to kind of sample 
what people's energy bills look like. But at the national level, this is the data that we have. I know that there are some studies in the US that try to like um, put some kind of like statistical bounds on like people's ability to estimate like their energy spending versus actual spending. Uh, and it'll be, um, I, I think I know for a fact that there are some academics in Canada who are interested in that kind of research and I'm working with them to see what that would look like. But, you know, academic research takes a long time, but that would be something I'd be definitely interested in looking into for sure. So before I go into the, into the chat box again, just one sort of follow-up question on that would be one of the things that you're recommending is that federal government and other government programs target the most vulnerable parts of the population. How would they go about doing that if the only data that we actually have access to is self-reported self data through the census, which doesn't give us a very good picture of exactly who's vulnerable and who isn't? Good question, Terry. Uh, you know, we can draw example from the United States, which, uh, you know, I do not do not often look south of the border for uh, policy inspiration, I will tell you that, having lived there, maybe that's given me a bit of a license to make a little bit of a fun of them. But um, the, what the United States uh, Federal Weatherization Assistance Program, it's a, a federal program that's been running every single year for the last 50 years, five zero years, since the Carter administration. Uh, the, the U.S. has had a national federal low-income energy assistance program. Canada has none currently, right? Um, what the the U.S. Federal Weatherization Assistance Program does is that, you know, they have evaluated over time, uh, it, taken a qualitative approach to understanding who is vulnerable to energy poverty. Like we talked about earlier, seniors are particularly more vulnerable to risks that energy poverty poses in terms of physical health, mental health, a sudden risk of injuries and falls. And so the U.S. Weatherization Assistance Program prioritizes seniors, uh, families with young children, uh, people living uh, in uh, with uh, long-term illness, people uh, with chronic illnesses, people with disabilities, and so on. And so, so that's one approach to do it. Uh, another approach to do it that I see have seen some local programs use is that you just simply ask people for their energy bills. And in, in many provinces in Ontario, there's something called the green button data where uh, a, a trusted third party can just with a click of a button, download what your last one year of energy bills look like, and then based on that, we can kind of prioritize at the at at the like the household to household level. But at the kind of a national level, we can just have some principles that we are focused on vulnerable households, and then we have room to define vulnerability. So CMHC has like a, a, a twelve different definitions of who they call like households most in need, you know, proxy for vulnerability, yeah, including newcomers and single parents and so on. So different communities can then define vulnerability. I mean, vulnerability in rural communities looks different, right? If you don't have, if you do not drive, you are vulnerable to certain things and certain aspects of life than you would if you had access to a vehicle. So um, I my approach would be that the government, that the federal government focus on vulnerability and maybe work with like local implementers to better understand what vulnerability looks like in their community and design programs to uh, to meet uh, their needs. Okay, so Gail Greer is asking um, about the silos that you talked about. I take it between the low-income programs where you mentioned that there was no fuel switching, for example. Um, she's asking about those silos that, uh, have they been created by the energy suppliers themselves and and how, they, how can they be prevented from de derailing a kind of a more comprehensive uh, a look at, at households. So they choose the best kind of outcome that would meet both the energy poverty reduction, but also climate uh, climate target, you know, roles, uh, you know, at the same time. Uh, Gail, that's a fantastic question. Um, what we are seeing really is that like the um, energy suppliers are just doing what the regulators are asking them to do. What the regulators are asking them to do is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, uh, or to, or or actually, what they're uh, in the. Uh, so I'll speak about natural gas suppliers. What regulators are asking them to do is to reduce, uh, a, you know, um, cubic feet of uh, gas. And if you if if they reduce energy um, in a, in a, in a portfolio by a certain number, they get a certain percentage of. Uh, 
uh, a, a bonus associated with it, right? So they are doing what regulators are asking them to do. So one way to do this would be to uh, give them uh, to us align incentives in a way that uh, that uh, that these things are not siloed, so that these programs are not happening in silo. The good news is in Ontario, uh, the electricity program, uh, the electricity uh, ISO, the electricity independent electricity system operator, and Enbridge Gas, they actually coordinate and 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 almost co-deliver programs. So if if, if you call. Uh, for for energy assistance to Enbridge, and if it turns out that you were heating with something else, you get moved over to the ISO file, and they both work with the same implementation partner, so that regardless of what you're using to heat your home, one or the other will come uh, and help meet the work. So there is some kind of like at the local level, provincial level, there is some kind of like uh, mechanisms happening like that, which are great, which are awesome. I also um, heard recently that. Uh, um, Enbridge is also exploring um, doing fuel switching for heat pumps in the low-income program. ISO now has a heat pump program for low-income uh, households that heat with electricity, and Enbridge is in the process, I believe, uh, of putting together a, a package for the regulators to uh, uh, for them to um, sanction and approve giving low-income households, switching them off from furnace to a heat pump and so change is happening. Change is happening slowly. And so while this is happening at the local level, what the federal government can do is to just provide, you know, like uh, like that extra level of incentive uh, and, and and to provide the resources so that, uh, you know, one of the big one of the big questions that uh, low income programs have when they switch people over to heat pumps is. Um, more often than not, switching a home to a cold source heat pump would require a panel upgrade. Most homes have a 100 amp panel. Uh, getting a heat pump would require uh, upgrading your panel in your home to a 200 amp panel. Oftentimes that costs around $5,000 to $6,000, typically. Um, um, utility programs are not mandated to provide that cost. They don't have a frame of reference to to upgrade your panel, which falls under health and safety, right? So what the federal government can do is to pay for those panel upgrades for households that can't pay for it themselves so that existing provincial programs can install heat pumps and stuff. So there is a role for the federal government to play and then clarify. Uh, we are hearing reports that some insurance companies, home insurance companies are kind of confused about whether or not a how having switching your furnace over to a uh, cold climate heat pump will affect insurance. Does it mean that you're now more likely or less likely to experience uh, you know, cat catastrophic failure, equipment failure in the coldest winter? There's a lot of misconception about uh, heat pumps and stuff uh, and, and the risk portfolio of, uh, of uh, other, other risks of heat pumps among some insurers in Canada. The federal government can work with existing insurers to help them better understand the technology, help them develop their risk portfolios so that you know people don't run into problems with their insurance company if they choose to switch to a cleaner, more efficient heating system like um, heat pumps. So I think that that's the role the federal government can play. Uh, even though like these silos are regulated provincially, there is a strong role for the federal government in kind of busting these silos so that people who need access to these programs are able to get it regardless of where they live, regardless of what fuel they use uh, to heat their homes. Okay, so Susan uh, Sue McKenzie asks is asking a question that that touches on um, embodied carbon. She says that in addition to reducing operational carbon pollution, how can we and your organization help push understanding of the importance of low embodied carbon in energy upgrade retrofits? Fantastic question, Sue. Um, if you have my email, um, I if you if you send me a note after this. See, I'm the energy poverty guy. There's another embodied carbon guy. Uh, there's a, like a building codes guy, Kevin Lockhart, his name is. He lives in Toronto. Uh, he's the ex he's the expert in, on our team on building codes and and uh, um, embodied carbon and uh, embodied carbon emissions and stuff like that. And we have uh, an active ongoing community of practice of people who are working with their local cities to help them uh, you know, adapt like that new 2020 model called building standards, helping them develop like local, uh, you know, building standards and things like that. So if you reach out to me, 
or I'll, I'll get your contact through Terry and I'll put you in touch with Kevin and then Kevin would be the person. Okay, so there's a couple of other questions by Tina Jackson from the Heat Bank in, in Halliburton County. She First off, she wants to ask you if you're um, any advice about what municipal governments can do in particular to take effective action on energy poverty. Man, that's such a good question, Tina. I, um, I, our mandate as a national research organization is to focus our efforts at the federal policy level, right? Uh, just a full disclosure. A, a lot of action, though, does happen at the municipal level because I know, especially through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, a lot of cities are developing community energy plans. Uh, local climate action plans. A lot of municipalities have developed climate emergency uh, declarations. Uh, I know a lot of municipalities are now doing uh, low in, um, sorry, um, low interest energy efficiency financing and things like that. There is a role for the municipal government to play, but I want to tread very carefully here because uh, the temptation that I have seen among municipal governments so far is that they will... Uh, get funding um, or they'll have raised resources for somewhere else, maybe Federation of Canadian Municipalities, maybe through a federal grant, and they'll create a local energy efficiency financing uh, tool to help homeowners improve energy efficiency, reduce climate emissions on their home. And then they feel compelled to like carve out a little niche within that program for low-income households and A, they either see like very low participation, which in in my view is actually a good thing because B, they spend a lot of time thinking about reducing barriers to people participating in financing programs uh, and not enough time spend, spent thinking about the risks that people face from actually participating in a program. If you're a low-income household, can the municipality guarantee bill savings? No, they cannot. What if you end up... Uh, due to change in circumstances that you're not able to repay your energy efficiency loan. Does that, will the municipality like come and, you know, bust your kneecaps? Like, will they come and, you know, foreclose on your home? Like, these are, I think, questions that I think municipalities need to ask. I know their heart's in the right place and they're trying to make programs more equitable and accessible. But the existing tools that they have at their disposal, I think municipalities by themselves cannot lead alone. I think a strong role for existing, again, I'm now venturing into like personal opinion territory. All everything I said so far is backed up by research. Now I'm I'm like Abby's like, you know, shooting from the hip, right? Having worked with municipalities uh, in 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 uh, my professional life, my advice to municipalities is at the barest minimum, what you can do is that you can help uh, people in your community connect with existing provincial federal programs. A lot of people have questions about: Do I am I eligible? I don't have access to this. I don't. I don't know. I don't know if I'm eligible. I don't know how much income I make. I know municipalities run tax shelters. I said not tax shelters. Sorry, tax clinics. Um, and so while you're helping people file their taxes, you can automatically point them in the right direction towards enrolling in an energy efficiency program. So there's things like that connecting people with existing resources that I think municipalities can play a strong role. Um, it, it, there is an opportunity through which they can provide and, and municipalities control a large amount of affordable social housing. So investing in them, leading by example, would be another way that municipalities could uh, play a leadership role. Creating local communities of practice. So when I lived in Guelph, um, I created uh, in partnership with someone else, a group called GEMS, Guelph Energy Managers, Estin Stein for anything else, it was just a nice acronym. We'd get together once every other month for uh, lunch, and we would visit one one of their so one of their facilities. So it was like the energy manager from the university, hospital, city, um, a couple of different local uh, like a brewery, and so people whose job it was to think about like reducing energy and energy efficiency in their buildings and emissions in their buildings. We'd get together, visit one of their tours and sites, and sort of like do peer review and help and support each other, right? Building capacity locally. And so um, what municipality, these are like low um, effort, but high, uh, low in, low investment, but like high yield opportunities, but it needs someone uh, with, uh, with, with, with that kind of uh, policy entrepreneurship spirit to create these like local communities of practice like this, so that, you know, people can elevate their practices. Uh, oftentimes, 
a lot of these individuals are working in narrow silos and so bringing them together uh, elevating their practices and stuff like that so i think that's that's where i see the municipalities as it stands right now playing a strong role one of the things i'm hoping to do when i do find some time is to work with the federation of canadian municipalities to uh, answer exactly that question like what is like the entire scope of um things the municipality can do oh by the way sorry if i'm lingering too long on this question terry i'll trust you to cut me off i'll say one more thing uh, i'm hearing you know quite frustrating stories from certain cities in ontario especially northern ontario and in some parts of rural ontario where uh, the local um uh, city is requiring uh, pulling a building permit just for doing pop-up installation, right? Not stripping insulation, putting new insulation in, uh, just topping up existing insulation. Most, uh, the building code in Ontario gives uh, municipalities like a lot of leeway in, in, in interpreting the building code. Uh, and so what, what the building code of Ontario says is that if you make a substantial and significant improvement or change to your existing home, then you're required to pull a permit. Is adding insulation a substantial improvement to a home or, or a difference from a home? Uh, I don't know, right? So if a low if 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 a low income program is has a budget of maybe two thousand dollars per home, may at oftentimes fifteen hundred dollars per home, spending half more than half of that and paying um, a municipality just like pulling permit fees, like that is such a uh, waste of resources. That money could have gone. In, in providing long-term savings and comfort to a household that needed it the most. So there's like little things that if you paid attention to that the municipality can do, but I haven't done uh, research on it yet, so I don't want to stray too far outside my lane. Okay, so Tina's other question had to do with um, the energy audit, the energy auditors who guard the, typically in a program, they guard the front door and the back door in mm -hmm. terms of being able to give you entrance um, and an exit that allows you to to, to get the to get the grant because they they determine the range of things that are necessary to be done and rank them and and then provide the energy audit that says that you know that you 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 create the eligibility for the program in the first place but then they have to audit at the back end in order to give you the certificate necessary to apply for the grant after the fact yeah so quite apart from all of the barriers that are built into that kind of a system um there seems to be a problem with the number of energy auditors mm -hmm. that exists. And, and to my knowledge, I mean, Enbridge, um, and I don't want to take this opportunity to take a shot, you know, at Enbridge, um, but don't encourage me too much on that front. <laughs> but, but the, the thing is, is that they do guard the entrance and exit to, uh, to the energy auditor registration program, at least they did under the federal green homes program or greener homes program. So is it seems to me that there is a relationship now between the the you know, what what Ambridge getting responsibility for all of those energy audits and the shortage of energy auditors that are available, and I take it that there's also and I I know this is a compound question, but the pausing of the federal greener home program seems to be creating an exit from the business for a lot of people because they now do not have the uh, the economics. To be able to continue their their businesses and their closing, so yep. could you comment on on just that energy auditor shortage, and and perhaps the reason why that may have developed? Yeah, so I mean, this is the problem with stop start programs, right? Stopping and starting programs abruptly creates these like false economies, creates these false you know promises for well, so it's like the it's like the peanuts comic strip, like you know. Um, uh, Charlie Brown and the football, like Lucy with the football. You know what I'm talking about? So, you know, Charlie Brown always falls with the trick. Like Lucy pulls the ball in the last minute. Every single time, Charlie never learns and contractors never learn. And every time, uh, you know, government comes in the previous version of Green and Homes program, this was before my time in Canada. What I learned was happened in 2011 under the Harper government, right? Roughly the similar program. Now it's come back. And it's called, it used to be called like Cleaner Homes or something like that. Now it's called Greener Homes. Um, and it's roughly the same mechanism. You're right in that the Federal Greener Homes grant, uh, grant is ending, but the loans are still available. So up to $40,000 in interest-free loans are still, my understanding is, are still going to continue. 
the up to five thousand dollars in a grant is is what is ending. But if you wanted to get an energy advisor to come take a look and give you the pre retrofit and post retrofit audit, so you can apply for the interest free loan. So you're still free to do that. Now, obviously, without the grant, less of an incentive to do that. The good news, such as it is, the silver lining, I should say is that low-income programs do not use energy auditors. They use energy assessors. So they're not like en like EnerGuide certified. You do not get an EnerGuide audit. You do not get an EnerGuide number. Someone with some experience with homes and built environments, maybe someone like me, maybe someone like you, will come to your home, walk through with you, sit down with you, give you some advice, um, tell you actually what to do and what not to do, measure things, and then come back and and do like you know and 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 it, it, oftentimes they're the same person that are installing the measures too is that they diagnose the problem and they and and they address the problem and then they have to come back and do a couple of different measurement tests to make sure everything was working right. In some ways, quite honestly, the energy assessors, like the uncertified, you know, like energy assessors, in some ways, I think may even be better than the federal energy auditor program because what what most auditors are doing are just churning through like most people want an auditor so that they can access the five thousand dollars they can access the forty thousand dollars right i got an energy audit um a lot of people got an energy audit I, no one sat me down and gave me advice no one told me what to do and what not to do at the house i got a report and i did what i could do with the report right so um the the reason why energy auditors are, there aren't enough energy auditors right now in Halliburton County, I don't know why specifically in Halliburton County, but I can speculate, is because the program hasn't had long legs and already supposed to be a seven-year program, two year, two and a half years, because it was wildly successful, it ran out of money, right? The thing to focus on is that how do we create business models through which like people will naturally want to become energy auditors um, and, and, and service? And is there a natural economy here? Is there a natural business model here? One way to think about doing this is that what if uh, when you sell a home, you have to disclose its, um, its energy efficiency rating? Um, Right, right there on the MLS website, you know, you have to show square footage of a home. You have to disclose how many, uh, how many bedrooms it has, how many bathrooms it has. Why can't we make people selling and buying, selling homes, get an EnerGuide audit? And so what that happens is today, Terry and friends, if I put ten thousand dollars on a new kitchen countertop, I know if I sold my house and. I don't know, like a couple of years from now, I would get like maybe eight grand off the 10 grand I put in, right? I don't know how much of money, if I spent $30,000 in improving the energy efficiency of my home, if I chose to sell my home, I don't know how much of it I'm getting back. So the value of living in a high quality home is intangible and it, it hasn't permeated like our cultural consciousness in the way that kitchen countertops and tiles and bathrooms have. There is no property brothers for heat pumps, right? For example, there's no HGTV show on um, on climate retrofits of homes, and so uh, as a consequence of this, like the the subset of people that are prioritizing uh, high uh, performing homes are homeowners. First subset already 60, 30 percent, thirty three percent of people are out because they're renters. Two people who have um, access to capital. Now you've lost another 50% of the 60%. See, people who for whom this is a forever home because they plan on living here for a long time and they want to live in a, a high quality home. Uh, four who have like actual problems they're trying to solve in the home. Yes, like a lot of people are motivated by climate, but if there are actual like comfort problems, my home, my windows drafty, my wall it keeps getting wet. Those problems are more tangible to some people than in, in some ways climate, right? So, so once you start multiplying these fractions together, you end up with a tiny fraction of people that represents the market for an energy advisor. So why Halliburton doesn't have it is because the market for people who want an energy advisor is probably low. Now, what we need to focus on is, is expanding that circle, that, that pie, expanding the piece of the pie, expanding that circle of opportunity so that more people want to become energy advisors. Um, the good news specific to the question that you're asking on energy guides is that I am, this is complete speculation territory, by the way. 
uh, is just reading between the tea leaves between what the minister Wilkinson is saying, uh, between what I'm reading in the reports and stuff like that. I think as an interim solution, uh, when the next greener version of Greener Homes comes out, the the first audit is going to be a virtual audit. They will not require uh, an in-person audit for certain measures, especially for upgrading heating and stuff like that. Because uh, I think there, there was a report recently that showed that you save a whole bunch of money and you help more people reach the program if the first one was uh, virtual. And if there's any, you know, if there's any challenges with that, we can fix it in the post audit or something like that, right? Reaching rural households and stuff like that. Virtual audits, I think, will become more common feature in the next Greener Homes program. And that might resolve some of the more immediate challenges that you're facing in Halberton County with having access to energy auditors. But in the long run, I think focusing on business models for people like energy advisors um, uh, is a, a path forward for helping align our purchasing decisions around homes with the decarbonization pathways. Okay. Well, thank you for that. I mean, I know there's some there's some comments in there, and I and I know that Pam Saney has had some some direct personal experience because she used to run a um, an energy auditing business and and found it very very difficult, if not impossible, to uh, operate with uh, Enbridge being the gatekeeper. Um, and and I th I think that uh, Pam feels very strongly that Enbridge uh, was driving people out of the business um, in in terms of how they were how they were uh, registering, you know, auditors in, 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 into the program and exercising their role as gatekeeper. There's also been some, some concern that, that what, because of their operating within silos, that they're trying to encourage people within the silo that they, that they, uh, that they're operating in, like the gas sector, for example, Enbridge would then be advising people or having people advise one way or the other of, of, of gas alternatives, as opposed to switching fuel switching to electric so instead of switching the program and sending them over to the ieso you know uh, folks uh, just simply you know focusing and saying no we've got a we've got a, a natural gas or fossil gas gas solution for you and encouraging people to get into that uh, that area i i don't know if you can comment on or want to comment on that but um, but i know that that is out there and we're probably going to try to spend some more time dealing with those kinds of concerns um, I, there is also a question here about uh, about other kinds of things that could be done to encourage um, municipalities to take uh, to take further action, including um, municipalities upgrading, you know, their their requirements with respect to um, building not, not building code, but but greener home kind of building standards. Going forward, I know that Toronto has a green standard, a green building standard, and so on. What's your take on whether or not municipalities? I guess this would be focused on new construction, but it could also be focused on retrofits of what the standards are and and what municipalities can do to actually, you know, put standards in place that are are pushing the limits with respect to encouraging, you know, you know, a transfer from propane or or other fossil fuels to to electric because I think you recognize and others recognize that heat pumps really are much, much more efficient and in the long run are going to save people a whole bunch more money. Yeah, Terry, so I am not the expert on um, building codes and compliance, but I spend enough time around them. So I'll, I will tell you uh, what I know. And so, But take this with a pinch of salt. Um, I, my understanding is that uh, municipalities are creatures of the province. Municipalities don't exist in the constitution. Like spooky, right? Like so, we, like technically, municipality only has authority where the province has delegated specific authority. And at any point of time, as we have seen indeed in Ontario, uh, the province can choose to take that responsibility away. Uh, the way in which we have seen this play out in, in other jurisdictions uh, is that anytime a municipality tries uh, to enforce a certain building standard, the province can then come and say that you actually don't have the right to do so, and the municipality will not have the ability or right to do so. Now, I'm not a legal scholar, much less a constitutional scholar, 
I barely know the capitals of provinces in this country. I've only been here for a few short years. What I can tell you is that this is a very much an area of focus and research uh, for a lot of people. And what people are trying to navigate is the tension between having a patchwork of different building standards in different cities in a province is also in some ways challenging for building new housing because the argument, right? I'm not saying this is my perspective. I'm saying the argument is having a patchwork of different standards in different uh, municipalities makes it really challenging for uh, for uh, people to build new housing because there isn't enough kind of translation of knowledge across of these sectors. So having a uniform standard across the whole province makes it easier for inflow of capital and inflow of labor and expertise so that we can move people, resources to places where we can build housing and, and giving municipalities the lever to demand higher building standards. The argument and the worry is that municipalities will simply use that as a lever to just refuse to build housing. Uh, and it'll just turn into a not in my backyard thing. And people will just say, yeah, you either build a 100% passive house, net zero, net positive embodied carbon house, or no housing shall be built in our municipality ever, right? Again, I'm not, I'm just painting a caricature of what it could be, but the, those are the concerns. So balancing the need for building like new housing and, and balancing the need for, build, uh, for building standards. So the argument that I think I have seen make, and again, Kevin would be the best person to talk about this, is that like in building new homes, we don't have to compromise between uh, higher building codes and, 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 and housing costs, is that if we elevated um, the building codes across the whole province uniformly, then it makes sense for uh, builders to learn to build. And now you've created a market for that, market for those high standards and people can then, you know, they, there will be more people, more builders and, and more tradespeople who learn new building techniques, who learn green building techniques, because now all of a sudden the market of opportunity for them is open across the whole province and things like that. So I think that's where, that's how I understand it. But again, uh, I am someone who is very firmly aware of my own limitations. And uh, uh, so I'm uh, talking about building codes is a little outside my immediate area of expertise, but it's something I do pay a lot of attention to. And that is just my perspective on it. Okay, well, I know this issue is going to be something that Environment Halliburton will likely want to pay some attention to. I knew, I know that the the uh, Seniors Climate Action Group called SCAN, Seniors for Climate Action Now, is paying very close attention to what's going on with respect to um, the municipal level and the elbow room that some municipalities have to go beyond what a reluctant provincial government uh, might want to do with respect to um, improving uh, the you know energy efficient building standards. So we'll see how this plays out. But I think that this is not this is the first, not not the last time this this issue is going to be raised. It's eight thirty now, but I do want to try to get one. There's one more uh, quick comment that I I wanted to to pay attention to. Um, I don't know where the impression came from, but um, Dave Baith writes that he uh, his insurance did not increase with a change to a heat pump. And I don't know whether or not there was any implication in anything that you or anybody else said that there might be some insurance implications if people are upgrading, like moving from you know one source of, of heat to another, like a heat pump. Are you aware of any kind of problem associated with, with that, that it's an impediment to improving the energy efficiency through retrofits or otherwise? Yeah, I what I will do is I'll just post this article in the chat. Uh, this was about a year ago. Um, I talked to the CBC about this. At that time, and this is a problem that persists in some parts of Canada now, is that some home insurers do not really know how to account for the risks of switching to a heat pump. That's it. Uh, and so as you'll see in that article there that I put in the chat, um, some people, uh, some insurance companies are telling uh, homeowners that if they cannot install a cold, just the heat pump, they can't replace a furnace with a heat pump. They can only use the uh, the heat pump as a in con as a hybrid with an existing furnace, or that they need like extra backup uh, heating, even though cold source climate heat pumps come with their own supplemental heating because heating strips. Some insurance companies are saying, whoa, 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 we don't know what's going on. We don't understand this. 
um, uh, we will require uh, you know you to install it. So it's just causing a lot more friction in the homeowner buying process of getting a new heat pump. So that's what I mean. I'm not saying insurance across Canada are going up because of heat pumps, like none of that, right? Like I just want to be very clear. Some like the federal government can actually play a leadership role here in providing more clarity and direction to insurance on how heat pumps actually reduce the risk of uh, you know catastrophic furnace failure and, and, and this and that, and like help insurance companies deal with, understand these risks better and understand that you actually don't need a separate backup heating because existing cold climate, cold source climate heat pumps actually come with their own back uh, supplemental heating strips and stuff like that. So that was the point I was trying to make. I'm not okay. trying to disparage insurance providers at our heat pumps. I think we can do that ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, okay, so I think that we're going to have to call it there. Um, you put that uh, that reference in chat. Uh, I just wanted to remind people that we're putting together a resource list of all the things that have been mentioned and more uh, in tonight's uh, discussion. And we'll be sending out that resource list to everybody who registered for, for tonight. And so um, you're going to get that, plus also... Once we've done some light editing on the recording for tonight, we'll be sending that out uh, to everybody as well. So with that, I think that we'll just simply call an end to, to this. Um, and I'll, I'll throw it back to, uh, to Susan for some final comments. You're muted, you're muted, Susan. Sorry about that. Um, thanks very much, Abby, for your very interesting and, and informative presentation. And thanks to Terry for curating the Q&A and for your involvement in setting up our, our Zoom meeting for this evening. And I'd also like to thank all of our participants for attending our event tonight. And as Terry said, you'll be getting our, the resource list and the recording eventually. Uh, also, Terry uh, has um, and Abby have had an interview um, for Terry's Planet Halliburton um, show, and uh, that will uh, air, I believe it's Thursday evening. And uh, next month, we're going to be having our annual general meeting on the Sunday of the Earth Day weekend, that's April 21st at 1.30 p.m. at Highland Hills United Church in Minden. And this will be a hybrid meeting, so it will also be available on Zoom. Our speaker will be Angela Bischoff, uh, Director of the Ontario Clean Air Alliance, which is advocating for 100% renewably powered Ontario by 2030. I hope you will join us to hear Angela's presentation. Afterwards, we'll have a break for re refreshments and then our annual business meeting during which we hope to have some nominees for new board members for Environment Halberton. So I'm hoping that over the next few weeks that I might hear from you uh, if you know somebody who might be able and willing to join our board. Environment Halberton has been around for 20 plus years and we hope to be able to continue to be around uh, for many more. So thank you again for coming. Thank you again, Abby, for your great presentation. I hope you, uh, everyone found our, the presentation informative and useful. And with that, I wish you good night. Thanks all. Thanks, Susan. Nobody gets, no, nobody gets to thank you. We got to deal with that. Thank you, Susan and Terry. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Christine. <laughs> thank you, Susan. Thank you, Environment. Thanks to Environment Halliburton and all the leadership there. Appreciate it. Uh, thank bye you. Bye bye. Good night. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Abby. That was uh, that was helpful. I think it was really good. I think that it got some good conversation going, and I think that it contributed to uh, to. to uh, broadening our understanding of all of the implications of that that energy poverty notion and how that connects to a whole series of other other issues that are tangled up in that you know climate climate poverty energy poverty and um you know resilience bundle of wax that, that we're all trying to deal with so thanks for that no yeah. thanks for uh thanks for including me in uh and, and I think that this is likely a beginning and not an end of the conversation about energy poverty. We need to have 
I think, much more conversation, particularly about how we deal with it and how we address it. And Environment Halliburton has a uh, electrification group that is meeting and trying to, we had a, an initial meeting that was talking about all of the things associated with heat pumps. And people came out of the woodwork asking all sorts of questions about uh, the details and, 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 and information about you know, how to think through all the costs associated with all the issues associated with trying to assess what's the most important thing to be doing to their house if they mm -hmm. happen to own it and how how they would actually uh, source a, a heat pump, determine whether or not a heat pump was the best way for them to go, you know, and, and, and all of the choices that, you know, that are involved, but then also navigate the bureaucracy in order to get the assistance that they need uh, in order to be able to actually make it practical so we had an initial meeting and then the electrification group got going we're trying to now build our own understanding of things locally with the idea of being able to do more active kind of uh, programming directed at, at at helping people assisting people making all of the connections you know that they need to make it to be able to uh, uh to to move forward with their own home or even you know even their rental uh, the rental uh, accommodation, but most, I think the vast majority of homeowners in Halliburton own their own home, but I think there's a huge problem in, in, for many of them being able to do the kinds of uh, energy upgrades that would make a difference. And then we have a, uh, a shortage of residential housing, but also a crisis in that, in that, in that area where I think there's a, there also is a huge problem, which you touched on in terms of getting, um, getting energy retrofits directed at that sector too. So yeah, makes sense to me. Do you yeah. have oh sorry if I'm No, go, go ahead. Do you have local contractors who are access to local contractors who are keen on electrification? Um there are. I mean in my own personal experience, I mean I had our house converted from a propane furnace to a to a heat pump, a, a Mitsubishi uh uh Zuba Central, and uh, also had a a change from a, um, a propane water heater to a to a heat pump based water heater, and nice. that was dealt with by a by a contractor just you know less than six kilometers away from me here in in uh, in, in Halliburton. So yeah, there are contractors who are on board and know how to do it, and they're learning as they go. I mean, there's some some uh, issues associated with their learning curve, you know, at the front end. Sure. This yep. is a it's relatively new for a lot of them, but they are gaining experience rapidly. And I, uh, I think one of the problems they have is attracting enough qualified staff yep. to meet the increase in demand, and that's Absolutely. a real problem for them. Yeah, Which and re retaining. Uh, oh, my smoke alarm's going off in my house. Wife, Susan, my spouse is not uh, a good uh, as good a cook as your husband seems to be. So <laughs> I think she's burning the house down. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, so a large part of it is, it's not just like, the interesting thing I find, uh, Terry, is that it's not just the technical skills, but also administrative skills, business skills, like soft skills, like what we call soft skills, right? Like the sector is, uh, because heat, especially with the heat pumps, the, the technology and the stuff in the sector is just as sophisticated as auto manufacturing or as sophisticated as a software. And yet from a government policy perspective, like uh, HVAC contractors are not seen as a sophisticated workforce. Like they, the policy just treats them like they're just slinging boxes together, but they're, these are like somewhat like very sophisticated, somewhat delicate machines that need to be like designed, right-sized, calibrated, maintained. And for businesses to like in, invest resources in them, they need like business support policies, just like how we spend all these billions of dollars supporting auto manufacturing companies, right? Because of workforce stuff, every every county in this country has uh, HVAC contractors, and yet for some reason, like we don't treat them with the same like a like salience when it comes to like business support. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely, absolutely. And and one of the reasons they have a difficulty attracting and retaining staff is that we have a huge affordable housing problem. Right in, in in Halliburton County, it's just awful, and uh, and so you can't attract people to move here if yep. they can't find a place where they're going to be able to stay. Yep. And so it's kind of like this this chicken and egg problem in terms of how do you how do you actually build a workforce? And then 
you know, if you don't have a, st a stable kind of, you know, government program to help low income households in particular, and, and then to build a workforce that can actually pay attention to that portion of the population, it just makes the problem worse. And it, it makes people leave the sector, you know, and, and, or just simply not be able to grow the workforce mm -hmm. capable of being able to meet the demand. I think there's a huge demand, an unmet demand here in Halliburton County for a switch off of propane. Um, I would agree. Yeah. On both, the wa on both water heating and, and home heating. And that's one of the major things that we could do to lower our emissions, you know, in the county. And so, uh, you know, these, these, as you pointed out, these things are all bundled together. They're, they're not separate issues. They're in the real world, the real world, they're entangled. So anyway, I so I think we're just about all out talked awesome. in, and you need to go and get some dinner. I do indeed. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much for doing this again. And hopefully this is not the last time we'll touch base with each other and and uh, and we'll and have a conversation with you about about uh, how we're going to how we're going to deal with this this uh, this bundle of really wicked issues, you know, that are you know tied together. So thanks again for doing this. OK, for sure. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, Terry. Thanks, friends. See you later. Hopefully okay. you'll see you in Halliburton sometime.